Good morning, everyone. I, uh, I'm so glad to see each of you, uh, both here in the sanctuary as well as uh, online. Uh, as I've said before, uh, we might be in different places, and yet collectively we form one congregation during this hour as we join together in worshiping our Heavenly Parent, as well as receiving ministry this morning. Um, this morning's service, Kathleen Cole will be the presider and I will be uh, the speaker, but before we get to that, we have a couple of announcements to go over. Uh, first and foremost, so uh, an email went out yesterday and I uh, want to just share what that uh, contained in case you haven't seen it. Um, based on new CDC changes, uh, we are, we are uh, enhancing our policy for gathering in the sanctuary. Is this me or is this this other one? How about I turn this one off for a second? Maybe that will help. Maybe, we'll see. So um, CDC came out with new recommendations this week. And uh, based on those recommendations and the new uh, landscape that COVID is now in the midst of, uh, we are altering or enhancing our policy here, which is uh, we are recommending masks be worn within the sanctuary. Uh, and uh, during singing of hymns, it's mandatory as you're singing a hymn. Uh, we recommend that masks be worn in the sanctuary as well as throughout the building while we are gathered. Um, uh, we also re request that uh, if you are experiencing COVID symptoms, uh, please notify the pastorate. Uh, we would like to be aware of that and we would also like to pray for you as well as others who might be impacted. So if you are experiencing symptoms or you have been exposed to somebody uh, who has COVID, uh, please notify the pastor so that we are aware of that. A couple of other announcements that we have. Uh, we will have our uh, church classes on Tuesday night, adult classes uh, at seven o'clock. That is both for the theology class as well as the Bible study class uh, starting at seven o'clock on Tuesday. And once again, that is via Zoom. And you can go to our congregational website, seaofchristsa.org, in order to click on the link to join those classes. Uh, going back to what I was just saying earlier about our policy enhancement, anytime we make any changes to the policy like that, we also post those out on the congregational website. So if you ever have any questions, please consult the website. Uh, obviously, you can contact anyone within the pastorate, but uh, uh, the website will probably have that information as well. This week, uh, our uh, Wednesday night gathering will be online fellowship night. So seven o'clock, feel free to join fellowship night. It's a great opportunity to chat and catch up uh, and just share time together. And finally, uh, as was shown on the slides earlier, we have a YouTube channel for the congregation that has uh, services going all the way back to April of last year out there, uh, as well as some videos that we might have used or uh, some songs that we might have shared during the course of our services. So uh, feel free to go out to our congregational uh, YouTube channel and, um, and look up anything that you'd like to out there. Each week we have prayer concerns and um, we have prayer concerns and grateful news that can be brought to the congregation by submitting those to Carol White by end of day Thursday. And we have three prayer concerns uh, that we are raising to the congregation this morning. We have baby Skyla uh, who continues to be hospitalized and prayers for baby Skylar as well as uh, families and friends. We have Diana V who uh, has been diagnosed with a brain disease. And so prayers for Diana. And finally, we have Denise P, uh, who recently experienced the death of her daughter due to cancer. Prayers for Denise, as well as family and friends impacted by her daughter's passing. At this time now, uh, Jim Burdick, will be offering the prayer on behalf of the congregation who will be joining us remotely uh, for this, um, this part of a family of God. He'll be offering the prayer over those who I have shared with you as, as having been raised. 
but I would also encourage you while he is offering that prayer to offer your own silent prayer as well. Jim. Our kind creator, we uh, approach you in humbleness, uh, in love for you and love for one another uh, because we have been, uh, we've been asked to share the burden and the concerns with some of our church family. And uh, because of this, we turn to you for a blessing in the lives of these that have asked, as well as those we hold in our hearts um, individually, personally. We know that baby Skylar is uh, very young and spent uh, her has spent her life in the hospital. Uh, and there is concern for her uh, being still hospitalized. Uh, we know that uh, Diana V's recent rather grim diagnosis is a difficult hurdle in, in her life. And Denise P uh, has experienced the death of her daughter and um, what, uh, what all that entails in terms of pain and the need for healing. Uh, you know so much better than we what, what that includes. And so often the things that people have asked for and turned to you for are things that um, perhaps we can do something about, but that need um, that extra knowledge and love that comes from our uh, master surgeon, uh, our creator. And then with you, with our faith turned to you, we feel like it is possible that uh, a oneness and a healing uh, nature can take place. We also see um, relief from things that uh, uh, have affected us and uh, even continue to affect us uh, because of the ongoing pandemic. And uh, we ask uh, that as we go through our daily life, we will know the things that we should do to help in combating, controlling um, this uh, horrible situation and then give us the strength and the courage to do those things exactly. We also seek uh, world, national, local, and personal peace and shalom. We know that there is a great need for all of us to learn to uh, live together, to uh, find ways that we can encourage each other in our diversity and, and celebrate and worship that. Give us a calmness of spirit that will abide with us so that we may become givers of calm to those around us. We ask all these things with the love and the teachings of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Jim. At this time now, we will uh, begin our morning service. Um, Kathleen Cole will be presiding. Good morning, everyone. Um, before we begin the service, um, I do want to just acknowledge that, that it is Communion Sunday. For those of you that are online uh, joining us from your homes, if you have not prepared your emblems ahead of time, now would be a good time to do that. Um, and for those of you here in the sanctuary, I'm going to go over a few mechanics of how we're going to do communion this Sunday in light of some of the new precautions that we're um, putting into place in the sanctuary today. Um, there will be an opportunity for you to come forward and be served both the bread and the wine. Um, I, I do understand that 
when in serving, you are getting fairly close within, within six feet of another person. Um, if you are not comfortable with that, we do have an alternative for you. Um, if you do not wish to be served by a person holding the tray, um, we will have a tray of bread and wine sitting on this front um, shelf. I'm not sure what to call that. Privacy wall, okay, on the front privacy wall. And you are welcome to serve yourself from those emblems. Um, again, those of us that are at home um, in the Zoom environment are serving themselves. So this is almost a, a hybrid option, if you will, for communion. You're taking communion in the sanctuary, but you are serving yourself. We just wanted to be able to accommodate everyone's comfort level today. So it sounds a little complicated, but um, uh, I will be uh, presiding over the communion and uh, I will be the first person to go through the line to just kind of demonstrate to you how we're trying to make this as safe as possible. When I take the bread from um, Lila, who will be standing here in front of the table, I will take the bread, move away from her and eat it. And then I'll go to Earl and take the wine and move away from him and drink it. And you'll take your cup with you. And there is an empty tray right over here on a stool. And you can deposit your empty communion cup in that place. But I'll, I'll be the first one so you can just watch, watch me walk through it. Okay mechanics out of the way. <laughs> I appreciate your attention on that. Um, I, I feel like it's another uh, opportunity for me to share my new life motto, which is grace and flexibility. <laughs> All right. This morning, we will be opening our service with a prayer for peace. But rather than a spoken prayer, we'll sing it together as a congregation. Please stand if you uh, are comfortable and join me in singing number 319, God's Melody of Peace. And again, if you're in the sanctuary, please remember that we are wearing masks while we sing. Hymn 319, God's Melody of Peace as our opening prayer for peace.
I welcome you today to the Shenandoah Congregation of the Community of Christ. Today's service is the second in a two-part series where we have been examining the story of David and Bathsheba from the 11th and 12th chapters of 2 Samuel. Last week, our theme was when we lose our way. As I shared in my message last week, the first service in this two-part series was about making a mess. And today we will be talking about how we can clean up that mess, right the ship, if you will, choose a different path. So our theme for today is repent and turn toward God. This is also Communion Sunday, where we come to the table to find mercy and forgiveness. In order to do that, though, we must reflect on and acknowledge the messes that we have made, take ownership of them, learn from them, and then choose a better path. I would like, you to, I would like to call you to worship this morning with these words from the fourth chapter of Ephesians, verses one through six. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, please join me in our centering hymn, number 73, as we gather, followed by the prayer of invocation. Again, if you're in the sanctuary, please remember we're wearing masks while we sing. I'd like to share the scripture reading for this week with you from the 12th chapter of 2 Samuel. But before I do that, uh, I'd like to share just a short recap of last week's scripture because it leads directly into this week. David sees Bathsheba and sends some of his messengers to find out about her. When they return, they inform him that she is the wife of one of David's most trusted soldiers, Uriah the Hittite. Even though he now knows she is married, David has Bathsheba brought to him. Later, she sends word that she is pregnant, and David tries to cover up his transgression in a number of ways. He asks for Uriah to be brought back home from the battlefield and suggests to him that he should go home and sleep with his wife, even though he knows Uriah 
has taken a vow of celibacy that is not to be broken until the battle is complete. Uriah refuses, so David tries to get him drunk enough to forget his vow. And when that doesn't work, he sends Uriah back to the battlefield and instructs his general to put Uriah on the front line where he is certain that he will be killed. So now we pick up in verse 27 of the 11th chapter of 2 Samuel. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and he grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now, a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord? By doing what is evil in his eyes, you struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. David is starting down the path of repentance. He is beginning to turn toward God. The first step is acknowledgement and ownership. I'd like to share a video testimony with you this is a, a short segment from uh, a TED talk uh, that we found a number of years ago. This is a TED talk about a man named Tom and a woman named Thordis. Tom is from Australia, Thordis is from Iceland. When Tom was 18 years old, he had the opportunity to have a year abroad studying. I'm assuming it's either his last year of high school or first year of college. I believe it's high school. Yes, it's high school. Um, Tom is 18 at the time, Thordis is 16. They meet, they have a teenage romance and they attend a Christmas dance together. Uh, Thordis is kind of swept up in her new maturity as a young woman and uh, decides to uh, sample some alcohol for the first time. And it, it's, it's very bad for her. Uh, Tom agrees to be her knight in shining armor and take her home. 
and then everything goes terribly wrong. Um, and there is a non-consent, there, there's a rape. There's no better way of putting it. There is a rape, he rapes Thordis. Uh, kind of echoing what we heard last week about David and Bathsheba. Um, I'd like you to listen to this short excerpt and you're going to see how Tom starts to take, he, he starts to refuse his responsibility. He doesn't acknowledge and then that changes. Deep down, I knew I'd done something immeasurably wrong. But without planning it, I sunk the memories deep and then I tied a rock to them. What followed is a nine-year period that can best be titled as denial and running. When I got a chance to identify the real torment that I caused, I didn't stand still long enough to do so. Whether it be via distraction, substance use, thrill-seeking, or the scrupulous policing of my inner speak, I refused to be static and silent. Amidst this noise, I also drew heavily upon other parts of my life to construct a picture of who I was. I was a surfer, a social science student, a friend to good people, a loved brother and son, an outdoor recreation guide, and eventually a youth worker. I gripped tight to the simple notion that I wasn't a bad person. I didn't think I had this in my bones. I thought I was made up of something else. Of my nurtured upbringing, my loving extended family and role models. People close to me were warm and genuine in their respect shown towards women. It took me a long time to stare down this dark corner of myself and to ask it questions. Nine years after the Christmas dance, I was 25 years old and headed straight for a nervous breakdown. My self-worth was buried under a soul-crushing load of silence that isolated me from everyone that I cared about, and I was consumed with misplaced hatred and anger that I took out on myself. One day, I stormed out of the door in tears after a fight with a loved one, and I wandered into a cafe where I asked the waitress for a pen. I always had a notebook with me, claiming that it was to jot down ideas and moments of inspiration, but the truth was that I needed to be constantly fidgeting, because in moments of stillness, I found myself counting seconds again. But that day, I watched in wonder as the words streamed out of my pen, forming the most pivotal letter I've ever written, addressed to Tom. Along with an account of the violence that he subjected me to, the words, I want to find forgiveness, stared back at me, surprising nobody more than myself. But deep down, I realized that this was my way out of my suffering, because regardless of whether or not he deserved my forgiveness, I deserved peace. My era of shame was over. Before sending the letter, I prepared myself for all kinds of negative responses, or what I found likeliest, no response whatsoever. The only outcome that I didn't prepare myself for was the one that I then got. A typed confession from Tom, full of disarming regret. As it turns out, he too had been imprisoned by silence. And this marked the start of an eight-year-long correspondence that God knows was never easy, but always honest. I relieved myself of the burdens that I'd wrongfully shouldered, and he in turn wholeheartedly owned up to what he'd done. Our written exchanges became a platform to dissect the consequences of that night, and they were everything from gut-wrenching to healing beyond words. The road to forgiveness, the road to healing, begins with acknowledgement and acceptance. Tom was able to take the burden from Thordis and place it on himself because he acknowledged what he had done. It took years and lots of running and lots of hiding and not 
a lot of acknowledgement, but eventually he did come to it. And later speaks in the video about the heaviness and the burden of not acknowledging what he had done and not accepting responsibility. That burden was lifted when he finally did acknowledge and take responsibility. It was excruciating. It was not easy, but it was necessary. I'd like for us to continue our service with the singing of number 260, Rain Down. This is our hymn of assurance. Again, please remember if you're in the sanctuary that we are masking while we are singing. everyone. So uh, Kathleen brought us up to speed from last week's story of David. And uh, that story uh, has just about everything in it. Uh, if you were going to write a Hollywood script, this had kind of checks a lot of the boxes of what would create a buzz or interest. Uh, so there is greed. There is envy, there is lust, there is murder, there is abuse of power, there is abuse, just horrible abuse, abuse at so many levels. And amazingly enough, it is all coming from one man, one man who is the leader, one man who is king, one man who is recognized and respected and 
carries authority, but all coming from one man. And uh, in last week's message, um, as Kathleen said, it was a mess. It was just a messiness. And it is a horrible story to read. It's a horrible story to digest and to think that there are actual individuals and people involved, not just a story of words. But this week, this week we continue on from where we left off. This week we tell the rest of the story and the rest of the story is more uplifting, but it doesn't become uplifting immediately. It is a story of the beauty of our heavenly parent and uh, our heavenly parents' love and grace that is bestowed on us. Um, but that love and that grace, that redemption, um, doesn't come without a cost. There is a cost. There is a journey that must be undertaken. There is a difficult road that must be traveled before you can get to um, that place of redemption that great place of feeling that love once again, even though it's there at all times. Um, the cost is that we have to account for our actions. We have to own up to what we have done. Uh, we must repent and turn towards God. So last week's theme was when we have lost our way. And in our journey, we are now lost and we are in darkness. Um, and this week we repent and we turn back towards God, towards the path that we know that we should be on. And yet we have found ourselves off of that path and we have to find our way back to it. And at the end of that, as we turn towards God, and this is the hard part, we must face God. We must face God in all of our humanness and all of our frailty and all of our vulnerability and all of our fear, all of our fear. Have you ever had something where you know you did something wrong? And then you say, well, okay, but, but maybe, maybe nobody else knows I did something wrong. Maybe I don't have to tell anybody. Maybe I don't have to truly divulge this. And it's that fear of facing the situation facing the person and taking on that conversation, taking on that ownership of it. And so this week we focus on how do we do this? How do we find ourselves uh, back on the path that we should be on? How do we find ourselves turning back towards God? And I love this part of the story because many times, it starts with a true friend, a friend who is willing to stand before you and risk everything and tell you what's truly going on and what you have truly done. And in this scripture, it is Nathan. Nathan stands before David. Now, Nathan was a prophet within the kingdom and therefore would be the right person to take on that responsibility, but it'd been easier for Nathan to run away and say, David, you're doing a great job. You know what? We're all happy with you. You keep doing what you're doing. Instead, Nathan came up to him, and Nathan was very smart. Nathan tells a story and says, and, and, and when I read that story, I thought this is similar to Jesus telling parables when he's calling people out and their actions out, he does it in a parable and it just takes some of that edge off. It's still very pointed and it's still very effective. And yet it takes some of that edge off. And Nathan shares with him the story of the rich man who slays the lamb of the poor man and remove and takes from him everything that he has rather than take from him on his own self. And as the story went on and Kathleen shared this with us, uh, David's response is, well, my goodness, that man ought to be put to death. That's horrific. That's unacceptable. Uh, I can't even believe that that would happen. And then Nathan, in that beautiful moment, says, that man is you. And there are moments in our lives in which it feels like we get hit by a two by four upside the head. 
And that was David's moment right then. And Nathan delivered it. A number of years ago, uh, living outside of Cleveland, Ohio, uh, I was a young pastor. And uh, I was a co-pastor with another person who had grown up in the Elyria congregation. And I was co-pastor with that person. And I thought, you know, I really don't have to, this person will handle everything. Uh, I just uh, need to do my pieces, parts here and there. And I really wasn't focused on my role at all. And I wasn't taking care of my responsibilities. And, um, and I thought I was doing okay. I thought we were fine. Uh, but I needed a two by four upside the head. It's what I needed. And one day, one evening, I came home from work. And uh, uh, we had answering machines back then. Uh, and I had an answer machine that had the blinking red light saying I got a message. And that was always exciting. Ooh, I got a message. That's great. And I press play and I listen to the message and I'm going to tell you what the message said. And I don't even think I'm paraphrasing. I think I have it dead on after all these years. The message was, Richard, you don't want to hear the message that I have for you. Click. Hung up. I knew it was someone in the congregation. I didn't know who it was. I knew that I hadn't been taking care of my responsibilities and those not taking care of responsibilities had consequences. And this person left me that message. And I didn't know what they were referring to. I knew the general area. I didn't know what specifically they were referring to that I needed to take care of. Uh, and I didn't even know who it was. And I lived in the upstairs of a duplex and then downstairs of the duplex was another congregation church member. And I went downstairs and I said, I have this tape and I wanna play it for you. Please help me know who this is so that I can go and make amends and find out what is going on and where I have obviously failed this person. Um, and I can start writing my own ship. I had listened to it probably 10 or 12 times already before I went downstairs. We listened to it probably another 10 or 12 times. And she said, I don't know who it is, Richard. Can't help you. I never did find out who that was that left me that message. But in the sense of Nathan, they were a true friend because they let me know that I needed to do something different and I needed to write the ship. And I began to uh, repent in my own way. And I began to turn back towards my responsibilities towards God in a new way. Sometimes we need that good friend. And when we have that opportunity to repent, we need to take it. We need to be cleansed. We need to express our gratitude in that opportunity. We need to reestablish bonds. We need to recommit ourselves to those responsibilities that we have, but also to our commitment to our heavenly parent. And when we do not do that, you hear words like what we just heard in that video, soul crushing anger, denial. I was in denial. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. We also hear words like imprisoned. But when we take that opportunity and we, and we turn ourselves back towards God, we have the opportunity to find that healing that we are so desperately in need of. And this morning, we come before the communion table, sacrament of the Lord's Supper, designated exactly for this healing process to begin. I want to read to you what comes out of the priesthood manual regarding the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, and it uses words that I did not expect to find. The ordinance, by casting us up against the plumb line of Christ, gives us a necessary and sometimes excruciating experience. We grow accustomed to the crookedness, and we need the frequent reminder of the straightness, which is our calling under God. I can tell you this in all the years that I've partake communion. I don't think I ever said, 
I would describe it with the word excruciating. And yet after reading that, I realized that is exactly what it should be when we find ourselves out of step with our heavenly parent and we are trying to turn back to him. The communion table is a reminder of that straightness that we should be on and that should be a hard experience. We heard Thordis describe with words like um, gut-wrenching as that path was started on. We heard words excruciating, one I just read, as well as how Kathleen described uh, this path. Um, these are not easy words to accept, and yet they are important words as we come before the communion table this morning. When we have entered into this exercise of partaking of the Lord's Supper with earnestness, with intention, with soul searching behind it, when have we lost our way? Who do we need to reconnect with? Who do we need to have those soul bearing, vulnerable conversations with? And when do we need to turn back towards our heavenly parent? And the beauty is God gave us the mechanism through this morning's partaking of communion. And if we enter into this with that honesty, then we can use words that Thordis used. She went from gut-wrenching to healing beyond words. Healing beyond words. I'll phrase it to you this way. You know, when a, when a, um, a kid goes to wash their hands and wash their face, sometimes the parents will say, now, did you wash your hands and face or did you just get them wet? Right? We come before the communion table today to be cleansed. And to be cleansed, we have to scrub. We have to do our part. So if we want to be clean as we exit this sanctuary this morning, first we must scrub. And then we can experience healing beyond words. I ask of you today, as I ask of myself today, please look deep inside yourself. Repent and turn towards God. We will now sing a hymn of preparation together, number 523, as we gather at your table.
As we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, I would like to share a short communion scripture reading with you now from the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord, but I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And now as much as possible, as much as you are able, please kneel facing the emblems while Earl Anderson uh, offers the combined prayer over the bread and wine. Oh God, we ask you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread and wine to the souls of all those who receive them, that they may eat and drink in remembrance of the body and blood of your son and witness to you, O oh God, that they are willing to take upon them the name of your son and always remember him and keep the commandments which he has given them that they may always have his spirit to be with them. Amen.
for our disciples' generous response this morning, we focus on aligning our heart with God's heart. Through our offerings, we are able to tangibly express our gratitude to God, who is the giver of all. As we share our mission tithes, either by placing money in the plates or through e-tithing, by sending a check through the US mail to me or donating through our local congregational website, seeofchristsa.org. Use this time to thank God for the many gifts received in life. Our hearts grow aligned with God's heart when we gratefully receive and faithfully respond by living Christ's mission. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Creator, we have come to your table today in the spirit of introspection and acknowledgement, seeking your mercy and forgiveness. And we are thankful for the opportunity to acknowledge also the many gifts that you have given us in our lives and the opportunity to return a portion to you. We ask that you bless the gifts that are given today, whether they be time, talent, or treasure, and that those gifts might relieve suffering in our world. We ask that those who are designated to use these funds to disperse them that you please bless them with guidance and with wisdom. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now if you would please join with me in our closing hymn, number 574, Touch Me, Lord, with Thy Spirit Eternal. Again, uh, when we we're in the sanctuary, masked when we're singing. And I would invite you to stand for the singing of this hymn. these words taken from section 163 of Doctrine and Covenants, verse 10, as our scriptural benediction. Collectively and individually, you are loved with an everlasting love that delights in each faithful step taken. God yearns to draw you close so that wounds 
may be healed, emptiness filled, and hope strengthened. May this assurance of God's love be with you always. Amen. And now at this time, we're going to have an opportunity to fellowship. I, I don't know if you've noticed, but we have a little bit different uh, tech set up and we are now able to have some fellowship with folks on Zoom at home. And the way we can do that is we're gonna have uh, a microphone right up here in the front pew. And those of you at home, you can unmute. You will be able to hear anybody speaking into a microphone. So we can have some two-way conversation, not only with everyone here in the sanctuary, but also those joining on Zoom. How do everybody online? Hello. Hello. Great to have each of you here today. Thank you. It was a great, great service. Yes, it was. <laughs> and Elaine, thank you for the updates yesterday. Of course. <laughs> I put it on Facebook too. In our Excellent. Group. Thank you, Kim. So I had just read an article about restorative justice after rape. Sure. So that, I guess I was being prepared for the service. It's so hard. Yeah. For everyone involved. Mm hmm didn't realize that before. Can you all turn down the temperature or something? It's getting a little too hot around here. <laughs> I was liking all that rain <laughs> for a while. <laughs> We're supposed to get some more this week. Hey, guys. Hey. Thanks for joining on Zoom today. Thanks for having it's nice us. nice to be able to. Yeah. Elaine. Mm -hmm. Where did where did you learn all that restoration that you did? How'd you learn to do? Oh, okay. <laughs> I've been a stepfather of like built houses and done renovations, and the rest of it was just searching on YouTube for how to uh -huh. do anything. She calls me her crew. You are the crew. I'm the designer. <laughs> you're the crew. Working overtime this did did you feel like the sound today was better than it has been? It was pretty good, other than that brief mic thing with Richard at the very beginning. Right, yeah. But you fixed that so fast. That was the antennas. <laughs> Don't ask us why. It just I held one and it went. It went away. So did you have to stand there and hold it the whole time? Or sit? Uh, it's right there at elbows length. So. I kept hearing something, and I don't know if it's when, like, when people were walking by uh, the camera, putting their after they took communion. I don't know if it was just something to do with hitting the microphone, or I don't know. It it wasn't. I'm just saying it wasn't real clear for me today. But you know, I'm weird. Um, but there was, I mean, there was a richness to it, but I, st I kept hearing stuff. Yeah. I don't know what that, maybe that's my speaker. I don't know. Some computers, the audio is really close to the mic, or the, the speakers are really close to the mic, and it gives you feedback sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, it seems clear I, for I wonder us. If that was, I wonder if that was at your, um, at your setup, uh, possibly. It's nice to see you all. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. I, 